Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Angel Soto. I'm the Programs and Services Associate for the Scleroderma Foundation National Office and one of many organizers for today's event. Thank you for joining the, the virtual university, and we're excited to host a special 90-minute program tonight. Um, we're going to have a panel of young adult patient advocates joining us today. But before we get started, I want to share some quick notes on today's event. If you're properly logged into the webinar, you should be seeing the panelists on your screen and hearing my voice. If you have dialed in on the phone, please turn your computer microphone down as to avoid any sound feedback. If you're watching this presentation on your phone, you may be required to swipe left or right on your phone to be able to view the presenters. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the broadcast. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started. I'm happy to introduce today's moderator, Amy Geetson. Amy Geetson is both a scleroderma patient and a patient advocate residing in Buffalo, New York, whose mission includes the raising of, of awareness for scleroderma on so many levels. Amy's diagnosis came at the early age of 19. Her journey has is described by many as frustrating, twists and turns, disinformation, uninformed healthcare providers, and more. Amy realizes her needs as well as the needs of young adults with scleroderma might be different than those of older patients. So she started to advocate as a young adult and has traveled to various colleges and hospitals in support groups to speak about youth, young adults, and the journey to educate others on the disease of scleroderma. Amy continues to provide support through her young adult support group and through her Inspire Scleroderma support group called Superstars. She is also on the Patient Advocacy Board um, for SPIN, the Scleroderma Patient-Centered Intervention Network, and is on the Board of Directors for the Scleroderma Tri-State Chapter. She has also worked closely with the Steffens Foundation for over three years, speaking at their Scleroderma Interprofessional Event in Albany. Amy also works closely with scleroderma drug companies to raise awareness for overlapping conditions related to scleroderma, including pulmonary fibrosis and heart-related issues. And most recently, she was awarded the National Volunteer of the Year Award. Thank you for joining us today, Amy. Thank you, Angel. You make me sound very awesome. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. <laughs> today, we're going to be talking about um, managing your disabilities and knowing your physical and emotional limits as a scleroderma patient and a young adult. Um, quickly, I just want to go through the panel and have them introduce themselves, um, you know, who they are, how old they are, where they're from, um, they're a little bit about their scleroderma journey, and then um, their living situation, be it at home with a support person, a caregiver, parents, um i live at home with my parents like many of you know so i will turn it over to kat davis you want to jump right in kat sure yeah i am kat davis i'm 33 years old i live with my mom um she is definitely my caretaker um i have been sick with scleroderma for now a decade um i kind of forgot already what we're saying i'm in spokane washington <laughs> And um, I have short-term memory loss. So those are my answers to my questions. Oh, and I'm uh, single too. I'm not affiliated with any person <laughs> other than my mom. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Um, Alejandra, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandra Serrano. I'm 27 years old. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a support group leader um, for the Southern California chapter. I live with my husband and my mom. Perfect. And last but certainly not least, our male patient, Arion. Hey, uh, Arion, I'm from California, but uh, I escaped to Oregon and I've been diagnosed since 2008. And um, I live alone. My family and closest friends still live in California, but I've made some good support up here in Portland area. And I have diffuse scleroderma. Perfect. Thank you guys all for joining us tonight. I appreciate you. 
Um, I know it's a lot to get out on a Saturday. So we just wanted to start with a couple topics about managing your disease as a patient. Um, I want to remind the, uh, the attendees of this panel that they can always use the question um, little box on the corner and type their questions in and at the end then um, you know Angel will read us some of the questions and we can answer them if you have questions throughout the panel. Okay, so managing your disease. So usually when you know you find out you have your diagnosis scleroderma, it's very overwhelming. Um, but as the years move on, you kind of get like a niche. You know, you get in your groove, you know what to do when something arises. So I want to hear from you guys about how you manage your disability in terms of whether it's something you do with medication, something you do with therapy that you go to, whether it's PT, OT, mental health therapist, or, you know, something that is unique to you with your support system. Um, I know with my dad and I, um, you know, every three weeks, it's that it's medicine day. So, you know, we have all my medicines out on the table and we put them all, um, you know, Monday through Friday in these little pill containers for, you know, four times a day, take medicine. Um, we do like all my vitamin shots that I need to do and just like bang it out. Takes about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours because with my hands, I can't pick up the pills unless I do it with tweezers, which takes a really long time. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to kind of know like what is something, a somehow you manage your disease in a quirky way that maybe other people don't know about you. Who wants to go first? Um, I can go first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Kat. Um, no problem. Um, yeah, so um, if any of on you, whoa that was not english <laughs> um, so for me um when i was diagnosed 10 years ago i got some really good advice from a friend who died about seven years ago but he was the first person i'd ever ever had met with scleroderma and i had asked him just right off the bat you know like if there what should i do you know now that i've been diagnosed what is something that he wished he would have done sooner that was quitting work um, so I did, I felt led to follow, um, what he said. So I quit work, um, immediately. I haven't been working for a decade. Um, I have, um, like currently I am, uh, terminal, um, I'm on palliative care and I'll be entering hospice in a couple of months, um, which I know everybody is, mine's very invisible illness. I look great. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> Um, but yeah, from the moment that I got sick, I hit the ground running. Like I went to Mexico for treatment. I have, I'm one of the only scleroderma patients in the entire world has undergone both types of stem cell transplants. Unfortunately, my scleroderma is so aggressive. Um, I relapsed from both. Um, so my main issue, my scleroderma, um, came back or active again as of September. And if anyone follows my journey, you know that I'm like this one day and in three days, I'll be in the hospital dying. It's literally the story of my life. But um, so I've done multiple things. I've literally done everything you can do for scleroderma. Um, I've been really uh, just a hard hitter on all of that. And I'm very, very thankful that I did that. And even though in the end, my gastro system will probably kill me, um, that's that's okay. I feel really proud of all that I've done and accomplished in 10 years. And I'm glad that I was extremely proactive in, um, in my journey and in my health journey. Perfect. Thank you, Kat. Now, Aragon, you're a little bit on the other side of the spectrum, right? Because you still work, correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm a remote work and sometimes in office, but I, I am the, the jobs that I've actually recently applied for and passed the background will be in person, more in a jail or in a correction facility. Uh, I just have to somehow run for a couple of miles and see how that works out. With They won't let me use the walker, so I'll see what how we get around that. But um, yeah, so I did the transplant also about five years after being diagnosed or four, and it worked immediately. I mean, Thanksgiving morning, uh, Tuesday, I had it Tuesday morning. My skin was so tight, you could see it pull from my face to my thigh, you know, like a lot of people had. But 
two days later, Thanksgiving, the skin, I was able to move my wrist. It started to loosen. Uh, so most of my issue now is um, related to the uh, scar tissue and ligament damage. And most, even before that, most of my uh, days were spent researching. Like I'm always seeing what new is out there. Because, uh, you know, when, once you get into it, you meet the veterans of the diagnoses and they're telling you there's not much, this is what you have. And so I'm on the other end where I'm like, well, if they had that, there's someone else looking for something new. And also, I like to do that because when there are new patients that get a hold of me, I say, well, this is what I did. Maybe it's better. Maybe you could get in sooner. And I learned things afterwards that I wish I knew before. So that's what I try to move to other people. Like, there's different type of braces, rehab that worked. Uh, but if I had done it sooner, I will probably wouldn't be in this physical condition. So honestly, a lot of my times I'm on clinical trial. If, I'm on different websites and looking for future treatments. And most people know that I still do adaptive sports because I was a college athlete, mostly basketball and track. Can't do either of those sports, even in wheelchair. So I do other adaptive sports, mainly table tennis or ping pong, what everybody call it, and skiing. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I didn't know that you, oh yeah, you you did tell me that you went through the transplant. I went when I was first diagnosed, which will be, I'll have my 20th anniversary this February of living with scleroderma. But I went when I was first diagnosed about five years in and they told me that I wasn't sick enough um, oh. to the stem cell transplant. And then I went again five years ago and I was too sick. Yeah, yeah I, I think there were requirements <laughs> that I kind of got around because no one actually had my official paper diagnosed. So whatever they said I wasn't ready for, I was going to put myself in it. Uh, yeah, you lied. So I, I met, <laughs> met Arion through the, tr the transplant. So I, seven okay. years ago, he had the transplant, three, my first transplant, three months in before I did. So that's how I met Arion was he was on the transplant floor and yeah, it's crazy. So him and I have been through this journey for many, many moons, it feels like. <laughs> nice, nice. What about you, Alejandra? How do you manage your disability? I think the same with Kat, just start really researching on different alternatives of what you can do. And if there's even natural things that you can take or different, um, a therapy that you can do on your own when you don't feel good and just read a lot mm -hmm. amen okay. yeah i think i it's mean so i think important for people to be extremely proactive um from the beginning and that's what i always tell people is like i know there's a mourning period of you know after you've been diagnosed but it is so pivotal and so important that you take your diagnosis serious because the sooner you get on something or do something, the better it's going to be in the, um, you know, in the future. Yeah. When I was diagnosed, there wasn't a lot of information out there. I was diagnosed in 2001. So, um, especially locally in Buffalo there, like I couldn't find anything and I was going to nursing school at the time. So I was really, like on it like trying to research and figure out what was going on and it took me a while to kind of get all my ducks in a row but I think like Kat said it's so important to just be a patient for yourself like advocate yeah. advocate so much for yourself and be willing to say this treatment's not for me no mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to do it you can tell a doctor no like Amen. I think people are so afraid to say, like, they think doctors are just the end all be all of treatment. And, and that's not necessarily true. You have to figure out what works best for you. And like, I've gone to second, third, fourth, fifth consultations and opinions just because like, I wasn't feeling it. Like, if I'm not feeling it with yeah. you, I'm not gonna let you cut me open or do some yeah. kind of yeah. weird test that I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, I always tell people like, this is your life. You need to absolutely be selfish. And there just cannot be feelings involved. And if you have to let go, fire a doctor, then you just have to do that because 
with scleroderma, you have no time to spare to be with someone who isn't, who doesn't have your best interest at heart. Right. And we, I mean, we've come so far medically, like, oh, had yeah. we been in the place where we are now, back when I was diagnosed, I probably wouldn't have lost all my fingertips from mm -hmm. the ulcerated sores and things like that. And I just think it's so great that we were able to make such strides. Um, so yeah, I think that's amazing. Have any of you guys, um, like, did like a double check on your mental health and like saw a therapist for that or had had a really hard time with mental health um in the beginning or middle or you know now that you guys would want to share or touch on i know like yeah i um i struggle oh my goodness so much with depression and anxiety and I never had had that before I was diagnosed. And my anxiety comes from, I get extremely overwhelmed even though I have nothing to do. It's just the the fact of I'm so exhausted, I don't feel well. So like any little thing to me is absolutely overwhelming. It could literally you know, be getting out of bed, showering, making that phone call. Like, um, so that's where my anxiety, um, kind of is. So I take medication for that. I have been on a roller coaster ride with my depression. Um, you know, a lot of people just kind of assume that depression is what they see on TV. And that couldn't be more incorrect. Depression comes in all different shapes and sizes. And for me, um, I can get very um, frustrated with those who are not sick. And um, when I start to kind of um, loathe all everyone around me who is <laughs> for like taking life for granted and like being like you are so blessed that you can shower and not feel like you're literally going to die for two days um that's where my depression always tends to go like when i start like staying in my room and hating everyone i'm like oh depression is strong and so i've been medicated um, on antidepressants for years and the best way i can describe it to people is like it makes me me again and I love it. It's like the most exhausting journey to go on antidepressants. It is no easy feat. You have to go in knowing that it could take months and months and months in different prescriptions. But once you find that one for you, literally it makes you like, it makes you you. And I can't be more thankful that I didn't listen to others and I didn't listen to the, you know, the stigma of depression. Like, I think it's important to be extremely open about it. I've been suicidal before. I've been, I mean, you name, name the game. I've been there. Um, so yeah. Um, mental health is a huge, a huge thing for me. It's just as brain health is just as important to me as my scleroderma is in my lungs and all of that kind of stuff. So. I think you like go through ebbs and waves. Like yeah, you have really good months or days or weeks of the disease and then maybe not a few, you know, a few weeks that are rough and then maybe a month where it's awful. So I think mm -hmm. it's super important to like manage your, keep your mental health on point and like just try to manage your disease as best as you can. For me, like routine is like my life. I'm a type A personality anyway, so I need columns and rows and boxes and <laughs> labels and, you know, like I need all that to have my wusa <laughs> in life. So, you know, I don't like change that much. <laughs> so when I got scleroderma, it was tough. It was tough oh. for me. So I want to move on to support systems and like how you feel i know most of us uh arian lives on his own alejandra you live with your husband um kat and i both live with our parents but um do you does it make you feel some type of way to have to ask for help or have to depend on people because it took me a long time to be okay with having to have people do things for me and still sometimes i'm not i'm like I could do it myself, dad. <laughs> Don't help me unless I ask, <laughs> you know, like, but you, and it's probably different for caregivers, but like, 
I don't know. Does anybody want to touch on that a little bit? Maybe Aaron, you want to touch on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, and I was going to say about the mental health. I didn't really have a problem. Like when I first got diagnosed, the doctor literally said, "You." At that time, I was playing semi-pro basketball and working probation, and he said, "You won't do neither one in a couple of years. So go ahead and figure out something new." Yeah, he was serious, but I guess he felt he could talk to me that way, which is fine. I'm, I'm straightforward anyway. And I was like, "Who is this clown? You know, like what is he talking about?" Because I never heard of it. And he was right. So if I find him, I'll apologize. Um, and then I think the hardest part was only after the transplant. You know, I used to see commercials of people working out, doing rehab. And I'm thinking I'm still an athlete, right? I'm like, I'm going to go in there two months later back on the track. No, that wasn't either. That wasn't accurate either. So when I realized that I won't be in that shape and uh, that I have to rely on help getting to the new topic, I have to have caregivers a couple hours. Then I had to have a lot more. And just having to rely on people, you know, there's, it, because if you have a way you want to do something and they won't do it that way or they can't, then you can get easily frustrated, especially if you're doing something for so long in a certain way and you think it's simple, you're like, you know, I have to teach some of these caregivers how, how to cook. You know, I grew up <laughs> in elementary where you had to cook your own meal because everybody's schedule was different. Uh, some people half clean or don't smell appropriate for me, right? Like, I think you should. Not, <laughs> maybe they worked a couple hours before they got here, but, you know, whatever. So those are, like, the hardest part, and that's that's the harder part about relying on people. I am germophobic, I guess people would call it, and so having to constantly remind them to wash hands, especially before they touch food, uh, those are, like... <laughs> That's the hardest part about relying on people. Everything else has gotten real simple. And uh, I would say the other thing is just, I used, I'm one of those minimalists where you just don't have anything out. Like you would go to my house to see a TV couch and that's it. You know, you think I'm moving in or out and I like it that way, but now I have to have things out so I can easily reach it, access it. And that's tough because you'll come in my house and people say it's clean, but I'm like, there's a fan in the living room. You know, and I'm, I'm broken down without a fan. I know I need it, right? But it's, I'm like, it's just too much. And it's really only three things in the living room. So uh, those are, that's the hard part about relying on people and having to, you know. Hey, Arion. Yes. Um, how often now are they coming every day? Your caregiver. Uh, uh, they come a couple hours, uh, two to three hours, a few times a week. Oh, if you still, okay, sweet. still too much. Still, I mean, I, are you are, are you ever just like call them up and be like, no, not today. Oh, like, I don't oh, want to be around. <laughs> there's uh, when I do private for the private ones, yes, I can easily tell them, and they're cool with it because they're probably I've known them longer. But the mm -hmm. agency is harder to do that, and then also the state takes it. In fact, like well, you, you don't need a caregiver if you can cancel a shift like that. They don't really uh, care. That. You know, they don't care about our being Well, you got your problems, right? <laughs> and then these women come in with their problems. So now you're taking care of your <laughs> And you ran at their boyfriend. And you never met this dude. you like, well, damn, he sounds pretty bad. But can you clean? You know, like, so. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, trust me, there's times where I, I wake up like, oh, man, this person's coming in today. Or someone's coming in and I want to sleep in. But they come in 6 o'clock every morning, That's or most mornings, and that's just what I got to deal with. Yeah. So for me, you know, um, I literally, it's about every month, a month and a half that my body, um, I call them episodes um, where I get really deathly ill. Um, but even with that, like, it's really been interesting for my mom and I, um, my dad died a few years ago, so it's just my mom and I, um, but it's really hard to navigate because like some days, you know, I have a good day. Right. And I like, I don't need her nor do I want her. And like, I get very annoyed cause I'm like, I'm 33, like, let me be. But then like 20 minutes later, I'm <laughs> deathly ill and I'm like, mom, come help me. <laughs> and so it's like a really hard balance and it's hard for her. It's hard for me. And it's just, it's really frustrating because we're our age, like we just want to be and do. And 
we can't like I, I don't have the luxury of going through one day without my mom's help at some point in time. But it's really hard to find that balance because I get, you know, I'm not perfect. I can be a little brat sometimes just because I get frustrated that I need help. And then, you know, it's just like a terrible cycle of like needing her, but yet leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. now that I'm, you know, on palliative care and going to move to hospice, I'm upstairs with her. And that's been really hard for me of feeling like they're shoving me in a room to die. Not really. Like I is my room is beautiful, but like, that's been really hard. Cause now we're up in each other's grill all the time. And like, I'm just, it's so awkward of me. And I'm an adult, like I'm a grown adult and I want to like do an, adult things and like not have to talk all the time i don't know we have a great balance but it's just hard yeah I think that's no i get it because uh yeah like i grew up like i said elementary me and my brother we had to take care of ourselves uh not intentionally but that's just how it worked out I mean, we had to work on the house so when you grow up independent so to speak because me and my brother didn't get along yeah. Uh, and then you know high school college you live on your own and then all of a sudden you have to have someone in your house in your space, it kind of throws you off. You know, it doesn't feel good. But when you're looking at, you know, six, seven, I can touch the ceiling when I was healthy, and now I need someone to change the light bulb. Something I keep, you know, I'm gonna let you keep. Oh, I want to get electrocuted doing that again. Or if I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get, so get you know, it. I, the smoke alarm goes off. I just let it wait out now. Get up there and fan it with a towel and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. What about you, Alejandra? Because you live with your husband, so it's a little Just different, husband. you know, because he's your yeah. husband, so. Yeah, I live with my husband, and I've been with my husband um, before I got diagnosed. So I was with him when I got diagnosed, and so he knows everything from the beginning. So something that I had with my mom, who was my caregiver, was that I, if I need help, I will ask for help. And that's something that I still have with my husband. If I need help on anything, I would just ask. I don't like to be like, do you need help? I don't like that. So I just said, this is the only room I have. Don't ask me if I need help. Whenever I need help, I will let you guys know if I need help. And it has helped because then I don't have them on, on me all the time asking me if I need help. Girl, come and, and live in my house. To have those <laughs> too. I, I did. My parents do stuff for me before I even ask. They're just like, oh. like if I have this cup and I can't open it, they're just like, here, t they just take it. Let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have friends like that. The ones who see me, especially with the acid reflux, you know, you end up oh. vomiting. I've been in, you know, went to people's house or hotel and I, I run out vomiting because I don't like to pe see people. Do. Like, I don't want someone to see me do it. And then someone else will say, what's wrong with him? And you know, he's just going to throw it. He'll be all right. Like that's where we at the point now where they don't even care what's going on because they know yeah. if I need it, I'll ask them. Well, yeah. um, you know me, I'm not about the whole TMI thing, but like because I'm my gastric system is paralyzed, stem to stern, butthole. Um, <laughs> I now have lovely accidents on both ends. Oh. And so that happened the other day at a friend's house, and I was like, yeah, I'm definitely just poop my pants. Um, <laughs> um yeah embarrassing like, okay so hashtags third term alive so when that happened like like your first time when you had like accidents or things where people that like maybe you're not in your household or not your like number one support system or caregiver like when you're with your best friend or something who is not living with you and taking care of you like how did you react like was it mortifying for you or did you laugh it off or uh for me i i'm so just like it is what it is and like i'm 33 year old 33 years old and i pooped the bed and my pants probably more than a flopping six month year old but i mean i just think it's kind of funny i mean it's obviously literally sucks um yeah but, but what else like, can you do my gastric system you know like i burp really loudly all the time like and i don't say excuse me because i would spend my entire life saying excuse me um so i've just owned it you know yeah. it is what it is and like 
I, I basically bring a diaper bag with me. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, what else can you do? Like, it's like, you can cry about it or you just got to figure out what your next step is going to be. And that's what I've had to do. And it's obviously embarrassing. I've had times where I have a friend here right now and like, I don't exact, I don't tell people that like I poop the bed a lot, um, yeah. you know, at nighttime. Um, and he's been doing like my sheets for me and everything. And I get like, so obviously I get more, I'm 33. Like, I don't know, you know, like I'm supposed to not be doing that. Well, like if you were 33 <laughs> but, and you were like a normal human, and that you would be like, and you, for sure. no, but if you like pooped the bed and you were living on your own and you were doing you your own you sheets, yourself. yeah, like you would just, no one would know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And now I'm like to the point where I'm like, oh, my sheets need to change for the 800th time this week. And, you know, I do sure. what I can. But like I said, I think the best way is I, we, like my mom and I, like my life is pretty hard, but man, we laugh a lot and it uh -huh. really, really like gets us through the days and I mean what else are you really gonna do because it is pretty comical that this is happening <laughs> <laughs> for sure for sure so I want to kind of get into like now that it's around the holiday season and kind of you know we're all kind of isolated and not really going out and doing like our normal holiday party festive things with family um if we were going and doing party things do, do you think that your disability hinders you from having like um a good holiday or a good experience um around the holiday seasons i know for like me my family can be really overwhelming when we're all together we are italians and we are very loud. <laughs> we are very blunt. And sometimes I can be over, I can get a little over, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hypersensitive about stuff. Like if somebody makes a comment, like, where I'm like, oh, well, I can't eat that. And they're like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. You know, or something like that. Like, I'm just like, okay, I need a minute. I need to go in my room. <laughs> I need time out. <laughs> or like, I have trouble, like kind of opening gifts and like wrapping things. So it takes me a while to open presents. And like, I always tell my family, like don't tape the boxes and they always do tape the boxes. And then they complain <laughs> when it takes me so long to open it. And so like, I love my family and I wouldn't trade them, but it's a lot, it's, it's a lot. So I wanted to hear from you guys, you know, if there was something that like, whether you're traveling to see family, like in a normal situation, not COVID, or, you know, you're staying home, or maybe you don't have very close family. So you spend the holiday by yourself. Like, how does that, how does that either enhance or hinder? How does your disease either enhance or hinder that experience? Uh, uh, this is going to be the first year I actually been with the family for about 20 years not because i purposely avoided them but i either always worked traveled for sport or then when the disability came in i moved to oregon they didn't really they didn't want to come to oregon <laughs> so i just didn't travel but it's actually been beneficial because now i don't have to go anywhere and people have to come to me on holidays because i just purposely told them i was like ah you know my legs get sore or i don't want to get stuck in someone's house because you know they claim we'll leave at three and then it's six o'clock and they're too drunk to drive. Uh, yeah. So I stay home. Because actually my teammate and I, we would drive to different people's houses and you know, people who else was along and say what's up for a couple hours and move on. But uh, the benefit has been able to stay here and have people drop off food. Uh, <laughs> and then if it's not good, I drop it in the garbage by accident. So that's been the plus of not being stuck and when they come over they're like hey you want me to set you up a plate i always tell them i just ate i probably didn't but this way i don't have to I go love it. All this, you know and so that worked a lot until they saw me participating in adaptive sports and then most people realized i just didn't want to leave so sometimes people don't stop by anymore but um when i do travel <laughs> when i do travel i would say the hardest part 
is either being stuck somewhere, like I said, or finding the right setup, you know, because yeah. certain hotels have the right wheelchair accessible, some don't. So, but luckily, like, I just buy I just buy certain things. Like, I go to Utah a lot, and so I have things at people's house that they'll just bring to me when I get there, so I don't have to worry about where I stay down. Yeah, and kind of going on, um, bouncing off of yours, Arion, you know, um, I travel a lot um, to go see my family and I'm traveling this year for Christmas and my main, I mean, obviously, because my gastro system is paralyzed, I have an adjustable bed and I know this is shocking, but it doesn't fit in a suitcase. So that is my <laughs> that is like literally all I think about. And now we've, um, I can't express to you how many pillows I take. Um, literally my car is jam packed with pillows because it is, I have to sleep at a 90 degree angle or um, I will end up in the hospital with pneumonia for the millionth time and probably die. Um, but it is, it's so much work and like, I'm so high maintenance, but like not on purpose. It's just from scleroderma. And like, when it comes to like friends in this time of year, like, I don't know about you guys, but like before I got sick, because I got sick when I was 22 years old. So before that, like I was extremely active, like you were Arion, And like, I was always on the mountain snowboarding. And like this time of year, like all my friends every weekend, they're going to the mountain and they're going to go, you know, ski and snowboard. And like, it's really, really hard. And it gets really frustrating that sometimes my friends don't just, um, you know, offer to stay home and watch a movie with me because like, I'm not able to be in the cold like they are because of rain odds and all of this kind of stuff. And it can be, you know, Christmas is like amazing, but it can also be like just really, really, really hard. And it's a mental game to try not to put, you know, how I feel onto others. That's something that I personally struggle with um, and trying to remember that like they don't know what it's like to be sick. And so they don't understand. And um but it's it's really frustrating and the eating situation is always hard. I throw up seven, ten times a day. So I'm absolutely basically the most disgusting human ever. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm like I can't always go so like I throw up at the table a lot. I bring a bag with me and it's basically like if you want me around, you're gonna have to deal with it or I'll be in the bathroom for the rest of my life. But um it's just it's it's really hard. But on the on the positive end. I mean, literally being sick and have almost died so many times. I am so extremely grateful to be alive. I'm so thankful to be able to spend another Christmas here. It makes everything so much more special. Like when I see a kid like at the mall, for instance, like and see Santa, like to me, I'm like, I just like cry of happiness because all those little things are so precious. And I, you know, we see the world through a different lens. You know, when you're sick, everything is so much more special and you really get that everything that we have like is such a blessing. So it's just kind of a mixture of all the things for me. Right. How about you, Alejandra? Is there anything that like is, is typically hard? Yes, you? well, my problem is my GIs. I have a lot of problems. Um, eating, digesting food, even just drinking water can be really hard. So that's something that I had to express to my closest friends that know that I have to derma know that there's certain foods that I cannot eat. And if they have, they can eat the food. I don't mind them eating in front of me, just that I won't eat it with them. And I, I like that my friends, the ones that I'm really close to, they understand and they will do anything to make sure that I am that I am doing good, that if we have plans, make sure that um, I can go and enjoy myself. Even if I don't do what they're doing, like going skiing, we can go to the mountains. I can stay inside the cabin and enjoy being in the cabin with my friends and they can go out and ski or do whatever they have to do, but I will still go and join them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. And like Kat said, yeah, everything, everything that you do every day, it's a blessing. Like I, I precious every moment that I have with family, friends, especially now with everything that's going on and 
still being healthy and i mean we have slurred derma but we're still healthy and we're still can be doing these webinars and be doing other things to help um other people just have to enjoy life yeah i, I mean, mean that's, that's what it's all about yeah that's totally what it's all about you know i think that it you know what cat touched on like sometimes you feel kind of jealous of friendships or jealous that people are able to do things that you aren't able to do or that you used to do and that's tough and a lot of times you know i have to remind myself that because i'm sick it's not an excuse to make other people feel bad <laughs> don't worry i have the same struggle some days <laughs> so do you i mean like i find it very hard i find it that sometimes people are less understanding because i don't necessarily look like i'm sick if you didn't see my hands you wouldn't think that there was anything typically wrong with me unless you know what scleroderma is and you can see our you know our mouths are kind of the same that scleroderma mouth a little bit in the the red spots but i feel like people are less understanding one because i don't look sick and two because i'm a young adult so i can't tell you how many like senior citizen stare downs i've had for like having a handicap sticker or like yeah. in a restaurant or somewhere where i need to sit down and like they come in and they're like giving me like the death eye because they feel like i should stand up and let them sit so i was wondering if you guys ever have like experiences like that or um you know something that you want to touch on and if you find it you find because you're young and some of us don't look that sick um if you feel like people are less accommodating or don't believe you yeah yeah i, I get a comment all the time that oh we forget because like in re in like in my real life like i don't talk about my sickness ever like I throw up and all this kind of stuff, but I just do it. I don't like make a scene out of it. It just is what it is. I don't like, you know, whatever. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it is, it's really hard for me because I've had two stem cell transplants. So I no longer have the look of scleroderma. Um, so I really look normal, pers you know, all that kind of stuff. And like, because of my transplants, my hands are really, really, you know, doing awesome. And they're a little bit bent, but nothing like they used to be. Um, I've literally, I can't tell you on the daily how many looks I get with my, using my handicap, um, well, it's just on my license plate, but I have literally had to prove it four times in the last like 10 years, um, to like, whatever they're called parking officers, <laughs> like whatever they are. Um, and which I love cause I'm like, bring it on. Let's play tit for tat. Cause I'm here for it. But, um, no, it's. Yeah, it's really hard. And my friends will be like, oh my gosh, you know, until like I have an episode in the hospital, they'll be like, oh my gosh, please forget you're so sick. And I'm like, yeah. And I just want, you know, and for me, it's like, I'm sick 24 seven. I'm miserable 24 seven. But just because I post a smiling picture does not mean I'm healed. And just because I am sick doesn't mean that I'm not still cat. And my personality is not going to change just because of my, you know, sickness and, that whole issue and that's always something that i really i mean to this day i get messages every day of like oh i saw you were out and about you must be like no longer on palliative care and i'm just like oh landolin i'm always like yeah i try to be nice but it can be really really frustrating when i feel like a i don't know anyone explanation on how you know my life works and it's it just can be a really hard balance and to not get frustrated, to be really honest, because I can get really frustrated really easily. As nice as I appear, I can be quite scary. So I feel yeah. I feel like too, like people always say, well, we forget that you're sick, but I always forget what it was like to not be sick. Oh, amen. You know what I mean? So it's kind of yeah. like, you know, a little bit different, but kind of the same thing. You know for sure now arian you are a little different because you're in your chair sometimes most of the time or sometimes you know and and people can kind of see that you have some disabilities do you find it 
like people are less compassionate towards you or more compassionate or how do you feel about that? I would say they're less threatened when I'm using a walker or a scooter. I mean, I was 6'6", six, six, 200 and something. So, you know, maybe 205, whatever. But, you know, I, I've heard the difference from me just walking in a room able-bodied to me coming in with a walker or a scooter. So people will now say hi or, who, you know, oh, do you need help? Instead of just kind of turning the corner. Uh, I would Does say- Does that bother you? Nah, I mean, actually, I'd rather people not talk to me in public. So I would rather go back to the old way where people left me alone. Because I also got a service dog. I don't use her as much. When I got her, I did need more help. Now I'm getting a little more mobile. So I got to deal with people that want to talk to a dog. Um, but sometimes when it comes to services and benefits uh, that disabled and seniors can get, I've had to appeal or I, even with medical insurance had to go to a uh, court. And, and I would literally say they're confusing my intellect for my physical disability because, you know, even just like this, people don't know I'm disabled when I go out, but then I have to say, hey, just because I can talk the talk doesn't mean I can walk the walk. And it's work <laughs> yeah. in court, you know, the judge was like, okay, I can see it, but I can understand why people didn't give you these services, then they kind of reevaluate. Um, I also go to comedy shows and I'm one of those people that like to sit front row and get picked on. Uh, <laughs> It's happened a few times where they did it. And then, you know, if they see the scooter in the corner, because I sit in the same spot, or if they if I come with a walker, they kind of hesitate. They'll be like, oh, I'm oh, sorry. And I'm like, no, keep going. Because then it's my turn when you're done. So uh, <laughs> it, it hasn't been too much of an issue. It's actually probably benefited me more when people see it now. Interesting. Yeah. What about you, Alejandra? I have the same problem with Kat, where People just think I'm not sick because I post a picture or a video of something that I'm doing, but they don't know if I'm actually, I can be in pain and act like nothing's going on because I'm not that kind of person that's going to want people to feel sorry for and be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, do you need, I don't like that. I don't like people being like, that. so I just act like nothing's going on regardless if I'm in pain, regardless if I had the worst day or the worst night of my life, I would just act like nothing's going on. So I have a lot of problem with people thinking that I'm okay because I like to enjoy my life. I like to go out when I can't, when I used to um, go out and, you know, post my videos and, oh, well, you're doing your makeup, your hands must not, must not hurt. Yeah, it took maybe like two hours doing my makeup, but it's yeah. something yeah. that I enjoy. So I, I think have, and another problem that I actually had too was with doctors not wanting oh. to see me because you're too young to be sick or you don't look sick. It's like my age has nothing to do of how I feel. Or how you look. Yeah, exactly. And then they're doctors. Right. I, but I think like we're in that age where social media is kind of like a part of our everyday. So if we are living with this chronic illness and we want to raise awareness for it, of course, of course, we're going to, you know, put content on social media and our platforms. But I feel like it's a double edged sword because yes, we want to raise awareness, but then it gives the plat it gives people the platform to feel like they can judge our lives. Yeah. You know, and they can comment on who we are as people. Um, or doctors will see us on social, social media and then feel like, well, maybe we're not good patients or something like that, or, Amen. They're gonna, you know, that. they might, we might bash their facility or something like that, but we're all just trying to get by and live and do our own part to kind of connect with the scleroderma community because I mean, I was, well, I was 30 when I met some, my first person that had scleroderma. Wow. And, you know, I was diagnosed at 19. Dang. So I feel like, yeah. So I feel like, you know, it was just like such a blessing to meet people with scleroderma, but also like now you, I feel like there's a weight, you know, cause I, it's my responsibility to like back these people up and make sure that like none of these people are alone and and feel alone or you know so i think yeah that's 
I've never had to fight so hard for my health, for things that I think are important, like taking my meds the right way, or when I'm like, if I'm in the hospital and I can't eat certain things, like I'm, I always feel like we're fighting for care just because people don't know what it is. Well, and I think it's, it's good, like kind of on a side note, I, I, I know we touched on this last time, but I just think it's always a good thing to say that like, shh, 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 shh. sorry, my dog. Um, I think it's like really important for everybody watching to know that like the four of us, like, please do not compare yourselves to any of us in how we choose to live our journey. Like it is so important for you to be authentic to yourself. Don't feel like you're less than if you don't talk about your disease or if you're not comfortable, like it is okay to deal with your disease however you need to. And a lot of comparison goes on in this world. And I know it does, especially in the sick world. People will be like, I'm not doing enough. And I'm like, girl, you're surviving or guy, you're surviving, like you're good. And so like, just remember everyone who's watching out there that like, you do not, you know, just please don't like think that we're better than you or anything like that. Because I did get some of those comments last time. And I, you know, I just want to make sure that people know that like, this just is my personality. Like I was just born like this. So I, I, you know, I'm just, I yap a lot clearly, but (laughs) you know, it's totally okay. If you want to live your illness in, you know, in privately, that's so okay. So yeah. Anyways. Yeah. So you guys have, you know, we've talked about what's that Alejandra? At the end of the day, we all have scleroderma, but we all have had it in a different way. Oh, right. yeah. Right. Totally. So I know we've touched on um, how we feel about or and how we look and how people treat us that are maybe not our friends, not in our social cir- social circle, not in our support system, um, and how that makes us feel. Um, and if they're empathetic or not, how do you handle less accommodating relationships or friendships? So what I mean by that is people who are close to you that are just not feeling it, like don't care about certain issues that you have, or if you can't go out one time and do something that they want you to do, they stop inviting you. Um, so friendships that are less accommodating, like for me, I've had to like throw away the toxicity like life is too short for me i'm not gonna justify how i live my life and what i need um so in that aspect i've had to let go of people that i thought were very important to me in times of my life um and that was hard so i just want to know how you guys deal with you know maybe people that are less accommodating of scleroderma I'm just like you. If you don't agree with what I'm going through, then I'm sorry, but you're going to get cut out of my life. Because (laughs) I don't have time to be explaining. And not only I can explain to you once, twice, but if I have to keep explaining myself that I can't do certain things or I can't eat certain things, like I can't. I can't be living my life explaining to you that doesn't understand. I would just cut them out of my life and see who my real friends are that will understand me and just move on. Do you ever feel like you've held on to a friendship longer than you probably needed to or should because um, it made you feel like you were still normal? Does that make sense? Like yes, you were still- I- yeah, I think I, I kept some friends that I wouldn't really explain to them that I had scleroderma and I couldn't do certain things. But after a while, it just gets tiring that they want to act like nothing's going on. Or or when you tell them, like, oh, hey, we have an event. If you would like to join, they don't, like, or an event for what? It's like, you know me for so many years. You should know that I have scleroderma and we do certain events. And then when I tell other friends and they're always there to support me, that's when I'm just like, I can't have people that don't understand what I'm going through. 
Yeah. And for me, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, you know, it took a long time for me to get up the courage and to realize how detrimental stress is for me and anyone who is sick. It is an absolute killer. And um, not only have I um, had to let go a lot of friends, but even one of my own brothers and some of my nieces and nephews and my sister-in-law, you know, and that's been absolutely devastating. But unfortunately, illness can bring out the ugly and even the, the most, the people that you love the most. And that's been definitely one of the hardest things ever about being sick has been the balance of relationships. But I've also, you know, unfortunately, there are times where like, we have to be selfish because we're literally fighting for our lives every single day. And yeah, but it has been detrimental for my family, my friends, all that kind of stuff. But in the end, right now I can be like, I love my group. My group is incredible. Like, and I do just as much supporting of them as they do for me. Um, but it's been really hard. I mean, I know tons of people with scleroderma, cancer, you know, anything you name it, like we're, there's been a lot of issues with family members and um, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone at all. I have four brothers and I, I lost a brother over my disease because he didn't, still doesn't think that I'm sick and that I'm faking it. Um, so it's just, it, it's really, really hard. Uh, I would say before it started soaring, so there's the benefit of actually being visually disabled, right? Where I was using a scooter or a walker because before I got diagnosed, I would say my, teammates and employers had a problem with me saying I can't do that as long or I can't do that same thing anymore. Uh, an extended family was a little uh, curious because they, if they know you growing up, they would know that this is not the kind of person that doesn't want to help somebody out or can't do this for themselves. And, you know, I, I remember my grandmother always saying, you only have five friends, right? And I'm like, that's your old self. But now that I'm older, I realize what she means because the same, the people who were new, I would say I have two good friends after being diagnosed, but the rest of the good friends seen me before I got diagnosed. So as it was getting worse, they still stood by me. Like there was years where I haven't seen people and they didn't know how bad it was because they said over the phone, you never talked about it. Or, you know, you could, no one could see how bad it was till I got off that plane. That's how dramatic it was. And they said, you still act the same. So that's what, I think for me, that's what kept them around because they said, you know, I didn't mention the disability. I was just saying, I can't do that, but I didn't go on about it. And so I still got those same friends. Like they see me go up, down, up and down. And that would be, like I said, I think the disability part helped because you can see as I'm getting, as I'm starting to hunch over or my hands start to, whatever you call it, uh, curl in, you know, you can't fake that. But they stood by me the whole time. They would go to all the walks. I would go like five walks a year on the West Coast in different locations and everybody would show up at those locations. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I'm kind of like cat too, where I had to lose some family members. Um, when I, at one point when I was really sick, we were, we, my sister and my immediate family had a very big benefit for me to try to raise money for medical expenses. And um, my cousins who I was super close with, there were six of them and, you know, we were all around the same age. Um, they didn't feel like I deserved, nor did I need the money. And they were very um, nasty about what I wanted to or choose to, chose to do with the money that I yep. received. So I think it's adult, you know, it, it it's it was very hurtful. It was it took me so long to kind of figure out like, okay, I'm not gonna let this. You know, stress is a big time factor in this disease. You know, oh, yeah. for our Reynolds, yeah. for flare-ups, for things like that. And so I just had to come to a point, and I think that that just takes time and how um, honest you are with yourself and with your feelings and with who you are as a person, which obviously as a 19 year old, I, that wasn't, you know, I was a mess, <laughs> but you know, grow, getting older and growing up and learning like more about myself and 
what I stand for and who I am as a person. I just finally had to let it go. And um, I don't regret it. I haven't looked back since. And I think that I'm it's very way. hard to do that. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else want to touch on anything like that in terms of like friendships, relationships, family members, or things that bother you um, in terms of being a young adult and people not really, like people just don't get it. Otherwise, we'll move on to my next question, which is um, how do you how do you all come to terms with like decisions you've made or decisions that you're going to make um, to manage your physical illness, like emotionally, like like say, let me just kind of map it out for you. Just say like the holidays, you need to stay home because it's very cold out and you can't travel and you have health complications. And so, but you really want to go out and you need to have that connection with your family or with friends. Like you need that on an emotional level. So do you, you know, how do you make that decision? That's the decision that's best for you. And then how do you live with the decision that you've made? Do you stay home and then you're miserable and you're having a depressive day? Do you go out? and then deal with the aftermath of maybe having a flare up like how do you pick and choose the decisions for yourself well i mean today for me is a prime example like it's a saturday before christmas you know and like you want to get things done and my mom retired yesterday so like we've been busy with those activities and like i was supposed to go to dinner at like one of my brother's house tonight and like around like one o'clock, I hit a wall. Like, absolutely, I am done. I don't feel good. I am fatigued. I am over it. <laughs> and like, it sucks. It literally sucks so much that every day I have to pick and choose like one activity that I can do. I hate it. It's so frustrating and I get so mad. But now, since I've learned so much that like it's not worth how my health will literally just take a nosedive if I even push going to my brother's to eat dinner. And it seems so like I'm not even doing anything, but yet that alone will literally make me nosedive into just feeling even more horrible than I do. And that's hard in the holidays because I want to, I always want to do but even more so now. And it's just really hard. But for me, like, it's not worth being up all night and being sick or it's just not worth it. Like the pain and the suffering that I have to go and I, that I feel it's not worth it. So um, that's where I'm at with it, but it still blows. I hate it. Yeah. I mean, but then like for me, I, there are things that I choose to do knowing that I'm going to have a hard time. Like I choose yeah, to go to the sure. conference. I choose to go to the national conference every year and I know I'm going to be exhausted for like a week after because flying really wipes me out and it's just a lot. It's getting up really early, but like, those are my people. Like I need to see my people and be a part of it. So I take, I take the end result because I, I know like I'm yeah. going to have an amazing time. Well, I'm sure like we all do, we kind of have to plot like, okay, so on Sunday I have, you know, this thing I want to do. So I'm going to rest Saturday and then I know on Monday I'll be dead. So <laughs> like, it's kind of like a game of arranging, you know, right. all the time. I'm always playing that game. Like, okay. So on Tuesday I have to rest from this to this or yeah, it's crazy. People don't understand. Like there's just being sick is literally consuming every minute of every day on so many levels that it's like literally you can't explain it unless you are us yeah. oh yeah like you like i always say like my illness doesn't define me but like it takes up like 85 percent of my <laughs> life right and like i kind of stopped saying that because just... i'm like actually it defines me 1000 million percent <laughs> <laughs> as i'm like laying in bed feeling exhausted and all i'm doing is talking on a computer <laughs> so ridiculous <laughs> How about you, Ariane? Um, how do you feel about like managing things that you want to do versus things that you can do? 
I'm, I'm pretty good at managing. I think uh, I stay physically active, so I know my pace. Like I know certain exercise. If I do it tonight, will or for me, if I do a lot of upper body, that's really what wears me out the next morning. But everything else, I know. You know, I pace it out. I know what's going to hurt me if it does the next day. Like when I go to the Scalera Derma, uh, you know, conferences. I'll, I'll, I'm going to squeeze everything in I can. When we in Louisiana, I'm going okay. everywhere, everywhere but the alligator trip. But I'm doing it all. <laughs> Only thing I won't do is eat something that'll bother me because I don't like acid reflux. So that's the only thing I won't, you know, I won't eat something with cheese or oil because it's not worth, that's not worth it. But I'll push my body to the limit just to, you know, because you never know what's the next time you're going to make it or do it. Uh, and then also, like my grandmother, she would always call someone lazy. You know, I had a, I worked in the morning. We had a double basketball game at night. She wanted me to do something. And I'm like wanting to rest. And she said, you just going to be lazy all day? I'm like, <laughs> I had a six hour shift, two basketball games. And then she could, so that's, you know, you know how like someone influential is always in your head. Yeah. So every time you want to rest, but you know, you got to take the dog out. Shit. I just hear it saying, you're just going to be lazy. So, I mean, it sounds silly, but that's what keeps me doing something. Like if someone really wants me to go somewhere, I'll go. But they have to call me before six because at around eight o'clock, I'm falling asleep. But if they call me ahead of time, then we're good. I hear yeah. you. My bedtime is eight o'clock every single day. And I will not let anyone get in the way of my bedtime. They can, but I just won't be, I won't be coherent. Like, I'll call right. them. They'll call and they know. I like human life after 8 p.m. Well, like, I'm, I'm, I'm normally you. in bed at 8, but I don't go to, I, I don't sleep very well, oh. so. Yeah, I don't sleep I'm in eight. bed. I'm in bed, but I'm up till, like, like 2. Same. Yeah. I'm the See, same way. We like watching boxing, and they all will get on the call and, around eight o'clock they're like you're gonna stay up this time this whole year we're it's the same argument you're gonna stay up i'm up <laughs> i'm up literally for round one i'm out and then i wake up at the end of the fight i don't know how i wake up during the announcement i'm like oh i missed it again but you know <laughs> they want to me snore talk about something unrelated so we used to it <laughs> routine. right <laughs> what about you alejandra i think with me i pick what's really important like i said i like to live my life i don't want to have regrets in my future saying oh if i would have done something with a friend because i couldn't do it because i was sick no i like to just enjoy it and if after i don't feel good then i'll just rest like kat said i know yeah. that if i have to do today i rest yesterday and i'll rest tomorrow and then the next day if i had to but at least i know that i did something that made me happy yeah, I feel I that way all the time. Like when I, especially when I go to the doctor and they're like, let's do the six minute walk. And I want to walk as fast as I can walk because I just want to like prove that I could do it, even though I never walk that fast. So when we yeah. do the six minute walk, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and again, for the people watching who are extremely sick, like, I'm not kidding you. There are days and months where like, I can't do anything any mm -hmm. day. And I don't have the luxury of even putting on the face or, right. you know, pulling up my big girl panties and getting on. Okay. That sounded so weird, but you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I, don't actually. I don't, I don't <laughs> plop and no, my diaper actually. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it sucks though. When you are like in a state, when you're in a flare or something where you can't, buck up and yeah. that happens a lot and it friggin sucks and and I, so i think that's why it's so that, important yeah. yeah so i think like that's why it's so important when we can do things that we squeeze as Amen. much in because they're like i was just laying up in bed for like a month with a foot uh a ulcer on my oh. foot that's still really bad and it i is. couldn't even walk on it you know so like and then you know but still i put i put my orthopedic boot on and i walked down the aisle so that my brother could get married and yeah. i froze my butt off and took pictures outside because they decided they want to get married on halloween and it was freezing here <laughs> well, but I you know like it was something i wanted to do as my baby brother and 
I wanted to be in those damn pictures. So I was going to be. Right? Whether I'm blue as no other. In I was the only one that had their mittens on. <laughs> well, I, I know what like you got to do. Yeah. I got to be thankful that most of my friends are very accommodating to everything. Like they, they won't ask me to just pop up and do something. When I travel, we all try to set it up. Like they know what I need. So most of them are pretty cool. They're like, oh, you know, we know he'll get up at five o'clock. So I'm the early person. But I'll stay with them in the late, and uh, yeah, they'll they'll set up a room for me. They'll put anything like cat. They stack up pillows. Uh, they'll change their eating time, or at least have me because I like to eat early, 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 and they're more late, late. You know, when people eat breakfast at eleven, I'm astonished. I'm like, you, you know, that's why. It's what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wake up at eleven, but they'll set me up so that I can just get up at five or five thirty and do my thing. So. I've been fortunate, and most of them aren't able to hang out late anyway. We're all in our late 30s and 40s, so they're not really, you know, doing the same thing we did in college. They're married, so everything's changed for them. We're almost in the same boat. We're all old. <laughs> they act old. Yeah. Really extraordinary, but I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I can't tell you how many times some group of friends I have talked blue in the face about how hurtful it is that I'm not included of things or they can't rearrange something for me to do. And that is something, it's just, it's so hurtful because like, I'm, I like, if they have a cold, I'm so accommodating, you know what I mean? Like, I'm so sweet about it and like, oh my gosh, let me bring you your soup, you know? And like, I don't know, it's something, it's really interesting how, I don't know, just relationships like in general, general are with, so yeah. hard. Like they're so hard and it's, I mean, thank goodness for you guys, like you guys, but like literally everyone with scleroderma and all my friends, like I could not do this life without my scleroderma and my sick friends at all. And like, if you are watching and you have not reached out into a group or a friend or anyone, like I really encourage you to seek someone out who is going through what you're going through because in the end, it is literally going to save your life, whether it's physically or mentally. But yeah. like, Amy and I are really close. And like, I, I, yeah, I mean, we don't talk about sickness all the time, but it's just like so great to be like, frick, I feel so sick today. And I just am and angry. We've really, we've only met in person like twice. Yeah. And it was like, we just Crazy. clicked. Like, it's just like you find your people and you find, people that take you for who you are. And I always say that, like when I get frustrated with like my healthy friends and things like that, you just have to take people for who they are. And if you're willing to accept somebody warts and all and know that they're not gonna be as accommodating or they're not gonna be as sensitive or empathetic to what you need, but you still want them in your life, then you have to take them where they are and who they are and know that you you might be an awesome friend, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be the same type of friend that you are. Yeah. Well, it's like that. So, it, I think the saying is you can't expect you from other people. And yeah. that is something that literally needs to be tattooed on my friggin' forehead because I definitely struggle with that. Cause I'm like, you know, I don't know. It's something that I struggle with, but yeah, it's, it's just absolutely crazy how much being sick affects every aspect of your life. It's crazy. It truly is. I know we've touched on like all of the awful ways that <laughs> scleroderma has affected our lives, <laughs> but how do you, like, what is one of the be most beautiful, like amazing ways that scleroderma has affected your life? I know for myself, like just being able to do this and being able to connect with so many people and help people and just meet all these different people and I've been able to travel and like do advocacy work like it was always my mission and goal in life like I wanted to be a nurse and I wanted to help people and I wanted to change lives and I I feel like I'm doing that and that is so beautiful to me to be able to touch people's lives even if it's like a breadcrumb of a touch <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I want us to all talk about like What's something beautiful scleroderma has brought? Well, I would love to share. Like since, you know, a couple months ago, 
And, you know, I went through months of trying to decide I am sick enough for hospice right now, but I'm doing palliative care. And obviously that comes with, you know, I'm going to die. Um, and scleroderma is going to be the, you know, is going to take my life. And, you know, being very, um, you know, I, I have, I'm choosing to go to hospice in a couple of months, but I have to say, like, looking back, the last 10 years have been the most extraordinary years of my life. And I am so blessed to have had this disease. I, the people I've met and the stories that people tell me of just like by me sharing me throwing up or pooping my pants, like how much like that's helped someone else in their walk with their um, disease literally brings me so much joy. And I am such a firm believer that like we are put on this earth to make an impact one way or another. And I, I'm thankful that I can truly say that I feel like I have and, but that's only because I was blessed with this disease and I feel very, um, just thankful that I was chosen for this journey, even though it friggin' sucks and it's hard as hell some days, but like in the end, like I have lived the most beautiful life and I see things so clearly and I don't miss a sunset. I don't miss you know, someone smile, like it's extraordinary, the life that I live. And that's all because I'm sick. So I am extremely thankful. And when it is time for me to die, I do not want people to be sad because I have lived an extraordinary life. Well, we will be. <laughs> Just let me know. I'll come on to you. Don't worry. <laughs> what about you, Alejandro? What's something truly beautiful and amazing that scleroderma has brought you i'm exactly i think the same like cat i am thankful that i have scleroderma because i haven't met wonderful people i would have never met you guys if i wouldn't have scleroderma i would have never met um my chapter that i attend if i would have never had scleroderma um great friends that i had made and it has made me stronger and yeah do things that I would have never done if I wouldn't have scleroderma. Now, I'm a really quiet, shy person, but when I got diagnosed with scleroderma and I started seeing how people were not wanting to treat me because I was too young, because I didn't look sick, and made me realize that I have to talk, that I have to defend myself, um, speak out, and now that's what I do. If I have to fight with somebody to defend that I have scleroderma, I will do it. And yeah. that's something that having scleroderma made me do, just defend myself, speak more, talk more, be more outgoing, enjoy my life as much as I can, because you never Amen. know what can happen. I can be okay right now, and what if I get sick in the night or tomorrow, and I didn't enjoy my life? Absolutely. Now I just Absolutely. enjoy my life, live every day, like if it's the last day, and just have fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, E? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. I could have done all this able body. <laughs> you know, right? uh, <laughs> You're like, F this. I wish I was healthy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember people saying, oh, I wish, you know, like this lady was on oxygen. She's like, oh, I'd rather uh, be in your situation. I was like, no, nah, I'd rather carry your oxygen tank like a Ghostbuster. <laughs> And then you, you can be, well, she didn't, the breathing was bothering her. And so I can get it. You know, we, if you had a breathing yeah. restriction, it, it sucks. <laughs> so no, I can't, uh, I'm not trying to be negative, but no, no I'm, be truthful. I could have been fine with that. I could have met y'all if y'all would have talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people didn't talk to me because I was tall and dark and I had this huge afro people avoided me, but. I was doing fine all by myself, I must say. Ariane, that, Arian, that is the truth. You know what? Your answer is my favorite because so many people feel that way. And that is incredible. And, and they just don't want to say it. Yeah. For being authentic. Thank you for being real. And your answer is just as valid as everybody else's. And dude, I understand completely. He was like, no. nope, I would have been an NBA player, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not having it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, 
Or dating a WNBA player, even if I'm All not. Right. Or <laughs> dating anyone. Frank. <laughs> it's hard to approach these same six, three women in a wheelchair. They don't look at you the same. They're like, nah, you're too short. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it helps, you know, men don't really like women who crap their pants. Who so. crap their pants, yeah. Or throw up at the dinner table, yeah. Exactly. I'm a real hair. commodity. <laughs> yeah, that might, that might throw me off for a second. <laughs> that's why i'm best friends with my dog and two cats <laughs> well i really love having you guys it's always such a blast it's amazing to have you guys and um that kind of wraps up what we're doing as far as the panel but i'd love to take questions from the audience for um our lovely panelists so angel or whoever's behind <laughs> the screen over there <laughs> <laughs> Was there any questions for us? Well, the Dr. Claw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got plenty of questions. And, and thanks, thank, thank you to all of you. That was wonderful. Um, but yeah, I'll get right into the question. We've got quite a few of them. Um, so the first question we've got here is, um, would any of the panelists recommend adding a mental health counselor as part of your regular treatment plan? 100%. I am a for, like I said before, you should take your brain health just as seriously as your physical health, 100%. Please do not put that aside. It is so important. I yeah, agree. I don't, I don't do, I haven't done it, but I, I recommend it to anyone with or without a sclera nervous. Just think people yeah. should check it out just once in a while. It helps to have somebody to just talk to that's impartial and that is not in your day-to-day -day or that doesn't take care of you um just so you can kind of vent and get a new perspective and you always have to take care of your personal health and mental health is part of that so yeah for sure yeah and please do never be ashamed either oh and i was specialist so i charge 20 an hour if y'all want to talk to us <laughs> I'm also uh, a therapist. My Venmo is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, we, this isn't a question, but we've had quite a few um, participants say thank you and, and um, you know, just really appreciative that y'all brought up um, bathroom-related issues and all of those uncomfortable topics that are hard to bring up. Um, definitely help them feel a little bit more normal. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. And um, the next question here, we've got. Um, I get very fatigued. My friends and family sometimes call me lazy because they just don't understand. Has anyone had to deal with this and, and how exactly do you handle it? Ariane, what about you since your grandma called you lazy? <laughs> <laughs> that was because yeah. she got too comfortable with my disease. She knew I had it. She just would know. She just knew what made me do something. I think that was her way of asking me to help her out. But there was um, people that did that. And there's nothing you can do. If they don't believe you and you've showed them, you literally just have to ride it out. Either ignore them completely or just ride it out. And I mean, I don't, you shouldn't beg for their, you know, believe or whatever. Just, I mean, and this is me looking back. I wouldn't have fought so much to get people to believe me. I said I have it. You knew me before. Uh, there's nothing I can do to change it. And they believed me later after they seen it, but at the time it was a long two and a half years where I'm having to prove myself and it didn't get anywhere. So my suggestion is just tell people either you just deal with it and get a mental health therapist if that works or just ignore them. That's my opinion. Yeah, and with my, my fatigue is so, so terrible. I mean, there are days where I can't even walk to the restroom myself um because my body is so um exhausted from doing nothing the, the previous <laughs> seven days but watch netflix but um it it really really sucks and like i said i mean for me i literally lost family members over it because of the you're lazy or like you have time to do this so why don't you work or all that kind of stuff like it is such such a real issue with people who are sick and especially if you don't have the look or whatever. I feel for you. It sucks. It's not fair, but I really encourage you to really, you know, if you are feeling tired, be tired, you know, 
rest. Do not let other people's opinion of you make you push yourself because I have seen it time and time again. It can push you into a flare up or all that kind of stuff. So as much as it's so hurtful and annoying and frustrating, like be true to your health. I think also too, um, you know, I had a few issues with like my sister, not that she like didn't believe me or anything, but like, I don't think she knew like the extent. And then um, when she was pregnant, she was off of work and she got to take me to all of my appointments and really talk to my doctors and kind of learn exactly what it was that I was going through. And I think that made, was able to make her a lot more understanding of some of my issues. So that could be a tip or a trick that maybe you want to try is bringing to them, them to some of your appointments and letting them see like from a physician, like what you're going through. Yeah, it's so hard. I have to shower tomorrow and I've been obsessing about it for three days because I'm so <laughs> tired already. Such a sad life. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, the next question is, my scleroderma has interrupted every tradition that my children and I used to do. It makes me feel isolated. How do you all work around missing out on these traditions? Oh. It's so hard. I have a lot of friends with scleroderma who have parents and I know that they'll bring in a friend or a sibling or someone in their life who can wrap presents with them or bake cookies or, um, you know, go to the park with them and take videos for them. And then unfortunately, you know, you have to do the best you can to, um, you know, include yourself, but like just, you know, the whole putting on your oxygen mask before your child is so, is so important. And just remember that like, as extraordinarily hard it is, like you've got to do what you have to do in order to be there for them tomorrow and to be able to do what you can. But I'm so sorry and I hate that you're going through that. And all I know is that I'm not a mom, but I have tons of nieces and nephews, so I've been in that position. And it's just absolutely heartbreaking and devastating and all the things. So I just know from friends that I have with parents like are that who are parents, that's what they do. Um, it's not easy. It never gets easy, but um, yeah. I think hard. also too, though, it's a moment to try to make new traditions. Yeah. Do things with your kids that maybe you, you, you know, never, never thought of doing, but now that you can still do, um, you know, my hands are really bad, but with my mom, I'm still able to help her with making cookies, which is like an Italian thing. If you're Italian, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, I can't do like a lot of the mixing and stuff, but I definitely, most definitely can frost and I do that <laughs> and taste. I can taste test. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think, although it's very sad and I'm really sorry that, you know, you're feeling isolated and left out. I think use your creativity and try to find some kind of new tradition. You know, my sister and, and I, she comes over every once a year at Christmas time, helps me wrap all the gifts. And that's a new tradition that we do. So I think new traditions are good. Yeah. And I think too, you know, on Facebook, not only with Scleroderma Foundation, but there are so many groups and pages on there. Like I definitely, if you haven't, reach out because there are so many Scleroderma patients with children who are going through the exact same thing as you and I know that that would be an awesome resource and I would also say do your best to accommodate to what you want to do you know if you want to go to a football game or whatever it is bundle up you know you might be the only one out there with a big snow jacket and I've been that person <laughs> you know you get the looks like why does this guy got all this gear on and it's you know 65 or 70 uh, and there's a lot of different types of tears, you know, whatever, you know, ask somebody, but if there's something that prevents you from doing it, like either it's the travel or whatever, just find a way to accommodate to that. And the best you can, yeah. The best you can. There might be a way you can still attend. You may not be able to, you know, play patty cake or something, but like Amy said, they do a new kind of game where they got card holders if you guys like to play cards together, so. Yeah, and give yourself grace. Give yeah. yourself grace.
for sure. Well, absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, the next question is specifically for you, Ariam. Um, a few folks wanted to know, how did you get into adaptive sports? What, what sports do you do? Um, what, what, are the, what is it like? Uh, it's, it's fun pretty much. I mean, you can be isolated when you get there, but I just, uh, after the rehab and I realized I wasn't getting better, I just went down the list of Paralympic sports because I had actually never heard of para sports. I used to work with a guy who was a lifter in the Special Olympics, but I didn't know about the disabled sports. And when I found out, I just went down the list and there's, I think, 25. And I, I literally tried each one, uh, any, any but the visually impaired. So they have a, like a few sports just for visually impaired. And I went uh, and I, you know, called the closest places, said, hey, I need a scholarship. I'd like to come out. I wrote a long email with my backstory. And if you've ever done interviews or on radio or TV, you include that in the email. And a lot of them replied and said, hey, you got a great story. We we accommodate you. We'll fly you out. We'll cover your practice. And I mean, I tried everything. Equestrian, uh, that probably almost did. <laughs> At first of all, I wouldn't have done any of these before I was disabled. I didn't want to get on a horse. I didn't get in the water and do kayaking and sailing. Um, they got wheelchair dancing. Um, and then, you were skiing, right? Yeah, so skiing ended up being something I can actually do. I started sitting, but I was too tall. So they said, well, just stand up. <laughs> and I walk, I walk hunched over, like you see old people with a wheelchair, and that's how I ski. So I have to look up after every turn and make sure there's no trees and cliff. Most importantly, kids are snowboarders, because those are the people that get in your way to uh and yeah, had a, right yeah. or, or <laughs> actually skied right over a kid that's how tall i am because <laughs> he stopped right in my way and then luckily i was tall enough to get over him but um <laughs> skiing and table tennis are the ones that i can actually do a lot of people still do the wheelchair so um so i would say there is uh you can type in like disabled sports usa and i'll put that in the chat disabled sports usa and find a local chapter or find a sport that you like and call them or write them and say, hey, I'd like to do this. This is my limitations. And they'll either send you to a local place or fly you out if they have the funds and just try it. If there's something you want to do, I guarantee you there's a sport similar or just like it. So cool. Yeah. And I wouldn't do it if I was healthy. That was a but I, I think I would have, but I wouldn't because I like I have a need for speed. I used to like running. I used I, I can see why my coach told us not to ski in the winter. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of sports and, and the community. They pretty much welcome you in. You know, so. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Ariel. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, we're get, we, we're a little bit past the, our time. If, if you don't mind, I'd love to ask one more question, if it's okay. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. The last question will be: um, How do all of you incorporate faith or or any belief systems into into your disability, if you do at all? Oh, um, I love this question. Alejandro, do you want to take it, and then we'll go around and kind of yeah. all say our piece. Yeah. So I was I was raised with a religion and when I got diagnosed with scleroderma, obviously I think we all get mad in the beginning because we don't understand why we have scleroderma. Why me? You know, we always say, why me if you're, you know, whatever. But then I think what has kept me going is my faith because that's something that whenever I don't feel good, whenever I'm going through something hard, all I can do is really pray and it will bring me in peace. It will help me calm down if I'm having um, an anxiety attack, for example, that's something that just praying for me helps me. And just, you know, just believing that there's a reason, like Kat said, there's a reason why we have scleroderma and not other people. You know, so that's something that I have done. I was raised a religion and then when I got sick it was just I have to keep believing that I'm going to be okay and 
I was chosen to have scleroderma for a reason. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. How about um, you, E? Uh, e, I grew what up. up? <laughs> I grew up Baptist. Uh, was involved with the church because I grew up with my grandmother, and she's from the south, and you know, was an usher, all the good stuff. Then it changed uh, in college, and thankfully, before scleroderma, so no one can say that's why I'm not you know, involved in religion. So they can't blame it on scleroderma. derma. This happened before I got diagnosed. Uh, so no, I, I don't, I mean, can I say atheist? Cause that sounds like a bad yes. word. To no, you can, absolutely, absolutely can. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, but I have no problem with religion. I actually encourage it to a lot of people. Um, and I have friends of Mormon, Jehovah Witness, uh, Jewish and all that. So I'm good with everything, but um, no, I just, like I said, my grandmother, I mentioned during that time, it's her and still having my good friends around me. Uh, I live for them because, you know, every time you talk to them, they're like, man, I can't believe you're doing that. Like, every time I go to complain, I think of you. So, you know, I can't let them down. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's it. I don't I don't look up to nothing. Just each other. It's honest. It's honest. So, love it. Kat, what about you? Me? Ugh. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, guys, for me, my faith is literally everything. Um, I've been a Christian my entire life, but when I got sick, you know, um, it makes you really think about what's going to happen, where you're going to go, when you're going to die, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, for me, the most pivotal moments in my um, walk with Jesus has been when I'm, you know, at the end of the day in bed it's just me and Jesus. It's just me, Jesus, and my pain and my throwing up. And he's the only one at the end of the day who really, truly gets my suffering. And, but how much he's shown me how impactful my story has been, has been a gift that I am truly, truly blessed with. And I really encourage people to, um, you know, seek out something that can bring you joy. Because for me, it brings me joy. It brings me comfort, um, knowing why I have this disease and all of that kind of stuff. And like, to know that, like, I am loved so deeply. And the fact that I am sick is not a punishment. It is not, um, anything of the sort, but it is, there's a reason for it. And I think when you could dive down deep into, you know, places that are not always fun to go, you can find the, the truest of joy. So, yeah. Well, tell them I said what's up. It's not personal. Oh, wow. <laughs> what? Tell me, Ariel. They hear it's everybody else, but let them know in case I feel that. It was a, I wouldn't. Not I bad think for me, I Bro, think for, I me um, for me personally, I'm not a big believer in organized religion, but I definitely have spiritual beliefs. Um, I believe in people's souls. I believe that we all go somewhere, wherever that may be after we pass, um, I believe things happen for a reason. And I feel like even if you are not believing of a God, I think you should believe in yourself and in what you can do and what you feel is right. Um, and I think you should believe in your friends and your family and the people that love you. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's hard to meet people when you aren't faith based. I'll tell you that. They'll tell you, right? You'll be friends or dating, and then they'll be like, Oh, what do you think about God and this? And you're like, Nah. And then they're like, Oh, I can't talk to you no more. <laughs> I like it. Nah. <laughs> I don't want to do it. On that, on that note, <laughs> I want to thank you guys all for coming and being a part. Thank you to all of the attendees. Um, this is not the last time you will hear from us. Um, we are planning, 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 and I really want to do a mental health yes, um, yes. panel next time. Um, so we're trying to work through that, but I appreciate everybody taking time out of their Saturday night to help me with the panel. I appreciate all of you guys and take it away, Angel. Thank you. <laughs> And, and just like you said, I want to thank everyone for, for sharing their time tonight, uh, everyone who participated, all of our panelists. Um, thank you, Amy Geetson. Thank you, Irian Moore. Thank you, Alejandra Serrano. Thank you, Kat Davis. Um, I'd also like to thank our 
Um, anyone who dialed in today and thank our diamond national sponsors, Actelian Pharmaceuticals US and Boehringer Ingelheim. Um, you know, we are hoping to host more of these in the future. So please everyone stay tuned to our e-letters and, and our website and we'll be sure to give everyone updates as soon as we can. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you guys. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. Yeah. Bye. Merry Christmas. Love you all. Are we saying bye? Bye. bye. bye.